so we all good on that. Wait a minute now, hold it. Now look, look, I 
don't believe in God, and I'm sure I don't believe in that Bible that you call God's Word. So how do you know God exists? Well, first of all, I know God exists because of the creation around me. When I see this beautiful creation, I understand that there is a cause and an effect situation. That when I see the creation and see the design of this earth and its beauty, that I know that where there is a design, there has to be a designer. And not only that, but such an earth that we live in has an intelligent approach. It reasons in a valid way. You know, evolution is simply called a theory or a thought. But then I ask myself, how can this world the control of this world, this beautiful creation, how can something come into order from chaos? How can something be a big bang and yet everything fall just in place? You know, the rain falls from heaven, it waters the earth, it gives flowers to bloom, buds brings forth the food that we eat, the snow does the same thing, it doesn't return the what it dies. And then when we take a look at this beautiful area, design demands a designer. For those of you that are here tonight that are live, you probably got here in a vehicle. And I can tell you, friends, that vehicle did not come together because a tornado went through a junkyard. That vehicle, like down the road going east to our infinity plant, or to the Nissan plant in Deckard, or the plant in Volkswagen in Chattanooga. I had to say that one because my wife may be watching or listening. And so when you take a look, they are laid out where they can assemble those cars. They have the design. They lay out everything they want to do, and the design has a designer. NBC has a summer program that's caught my attention. It's called Hot Wheels Ultimate Challenge. As a boy who played with Hot Wheels and would mount that little thing on the side of the couch and drop that car off and watch it loose, thought that was the greatest thing in the world. I may be dating myself, but hey, I saw all the good hot <laughs> bands and I live in a good time of life. Be jealous. But when you and I, when I watch that show, and I see how they can take a vehicle and they sit down they begin to design and make plans and lay out how they want it to happen. It just doesn't happen. It happens because a designer has a design and follows their end. So dear friends, when we see something such as this creation with beautiful design, it must have a designer. I defer to one Herbert Spencer from the 1800s, an English philosopher, biologist, sociologist, even an agnostic of the 1800s. Within the writing of his book, First Principles, there is a chapter titled Space, Time, Matter, Motion, and Force. From this chapter, it is stated, though space, time, matter, and motion are apparently all necessary data of intelligence, yet a psychological analysis shows us these are either built up of or abstracted from experiences of force. That's page 169. Now watch, friends, watch what he called it. He called it space, time, matter, motion, and force, and then defined it as necessary data of intelligence. Well, friends, I submit to you, here is the data. It is intelligent and it is necessary. I go to Genesis 1. Hold it, preacher. Wait a minute. There you go, go into the Bible. Dear friends, I have brought forth factual evidence of why I believe there's a God, and I am a Christian. I am a preacher. I am one that stands for God and in defense of God, and I will reach for his material to defend God Almighty. As we are able to prove with simple reasoning, let us take that idea of space, time, matter, motion, and force, and may I go to the first, first verse of the Bible? 
In Genesis 1 and verse 1, in the beginning, there's time. God, there's the force. Created, there's the action. The heavens, there's the space. And the earth, there is the matter. Isn't it amazing that one in the 1800s came to a conclusion of necessary data of intelligence that Moses, through inspiration, defined the very thing concerning God in Genesis 1 and verse 1. You see, when we look at this beautiful creation, the heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament shows His handiwork, Psalm 19, 1. I mentioned moments ago of the rain coming down and replenishing the earth and the snow coming down and how it doesn't return, but it gives seed to the sower, bread to the eater. Let me defer to Isaiah 55, verse 10. For as the rain comes down, and the snow from heaven, and do not return there, but water the earth, and may it bring forth in bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. Now, isn't that something? Something that we have drew a simple conclusion, which is true, just by looking at the creation, yet God, through Isaiah, brought it forth. In Romans 1 and verse 20, For the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. There it is. Even his eternal power and God is, so that they are without excuse. Dear friends, I know God exists because of the creation around me. There is no other valid description of such a beautiful creation than the Almighty God, who is the eternal designer of such a design and beauty of which we can partake. I would submit to you secondly that I know God exists because not only of the cre creation around me, but of the common sense within me. It was back in 1976, the two-letter phrase, God is. God is. And you know, there are many approaches to the proof of that proposition, but none as simple and as conclusive as that was used by the late for the Dr. Thomas B. Morin in 1976 with his debate with atheist Dr. Anthony G. M. Flew. I'm indebted to our friends at the Gospel Broadcasting Network who remastered that material and made it available for a viewing audience regardless of what generation it might be. Grateful that that is acceptable, that that is available. But here is a summary of the argument that Dr. Warren used concerning God is. Number one, human beings exist. No one, not even an atheist, contends that humans existed throughout all eternity. Therefore, there had to be a first human being. Number two, the first human in existence was either created or he evolved from lower forms of life. There are no other possibilities. Third, if he was created, there had to be a creator. Therefore, God is. But if he evolved from lower forms of life, then the first human either had to be born of a non-human or had to be a non-human turned into a human. There is no other possibility. And no evolutionist, atheist, or otherwise contends that one single non-human turned into a human or that a non-human gave birth to a human. Y'all with me so far? Neither of these being possible, the only alternative, that being man was created, must be true. And therefore, God is. Now here's something stuck. From 1976, I take you to 2004, that Dr. Flu changed his thinking, stating that he now believed in the existence of an intelligent designer of the universe. Folks, that statement shocked his colleagues, longtime colleagues, and also the fellow atheists that he knew. Yet he denied any conversion to a religion. His views were more of a deist view. 
It's like God wound up the earth like an eight-day clock and flung it out there, and he'll come back and get it. That's the concept of deism. And that is how he felt more toward that end. But what was interesting is Dr. Blue affirmed a lifelong commitment to go where the evidence leads. You've got to give him credit for honesty and evidence from science and natural theology made it possible for him to believe in an intelligent being who ordered the universe. Simple common sense and allowing to see how this folds out. God is. Affirmed in Psalm 139 and verse 14 how we are fearfully and wonderfully made. And when you think about the human body and how we are fearfully and wonderfully made, how you take a look at the human eye and what it can do. How the brain can store so much, so much material and knowledge. How the body functions together. And how when one part of the body suffers, it all seems to suffer. Is that not what the Apostle Paul affirmed about the church of 1 Corinthians 12? We're made in the image of God. Genesis 1 and verse 27. And I love Acts 17, 28, when Paul stood on Mars Hill amongst all that idolatry that was around him, and he pointed out that they had one of their monuments there to the unknown God. Paul said, Him I will speak, and I deliver him to you. And within speaking of God Almighty, he even quoted, this is stunning, he even quoted one of their Grecian poets who stated in him we live and move and have our being. How that the Grecian poets, those that within that time, within Athens, were always looking for some new thing. But yet one of their own. And I love how Paul and how the Holy Spirit through inspiration brought that in. To Paul said, one of your own poets said this. Dear friends, God is. I believe God exists. I know he's exi He exists because of the creation around me, the common sense within me, and oh, I could not wait to get to this one because of the Christ of whom history tells me. Think about it. You know, I like to look at history that writes about the time of Bible times. It's interesting how you can look at stages of history and how that book called the Bible will affirm it. For example, the Roman historian Tacitus wrote of Nero with the terrible fire at Rome in July of AD 64. And he tells how some people blame Nero for the fire, but Nero blamed the Christians. Listen to the writings of Tacitus, this historian. Consequently, to get rid of the report, Nero fastened the guilt and inflicted the most exquisite tortures on a class hated for their abominations called Christians by the populace. Christus, from whom the name had its origin, suffered the extreme penalty during the reign of Tiberius at the hands of one of our procurators, Pontius Pilate, and a most mischievous superstition thus checked for the moment, again broke out not only in Judea, the first source of the evil, but even in Rome, where all things hideous and shameful from every part of the world find their center and become popular. Now that's astounding. Now folks, this statement is more interesting when we learn that Tacitus was not a Christian. He wasn't a friend of Christians. He had nothing to prove. He didn't have sympathy, sympathy for them. He just simply recorded the facts of the matter. And in recording those facts, the facts were this. There was really a man called Christus, or Christ, who lived and suffered the penalty of death for Pontius Pilate during the reign of Tiberius. That is history speaking. When I see that phrase, Christus, what I think of being a native Tennessean, 
and located next to the most visited park in America for a number of years in Gatlinburg on the side road off the main drag was Christus Gardens. Many of you may have, you know, may have looked around. That was done, the life of Christ brought forth with mannequins and paintings and so on. Isn't it something how this Roman historian affirmed the historical Christ? How about Josephus, a Jewish historian, who wrote in the Antiquity of the Jews? Now, there was about this time Jesus, a wise man, if it be lawful to call him a man, for he was a doer of wonderful works. A teacher of such men as received the truth with pleasure, he drew over to him both many of the Jews and many of the Gentiles. He was the Christ, and when Pilate, at the suggestion of the principal men amongst us, had condemned him to the cross, those that loved him at the first did not forsake him, for he appeared to them alive again the third day, as the divine prophets had foretold these and 10,000 other wonderful things concerning him, and the tribe of Christians so named from him are not extinct at this day. Folks, there is testimony from a non-Christian that Jesus was indeed a historical figure. The years on our calendars B.C., A.D., you cannot help but to see how time is measured with the life of that one man. To walk through the area of Israel, through the land. Israel, not that big. You could take Israel and put it in the middle of Middle Tennessee, reaching from Kentucky to Alabama. It's not that big an area. But when you walk through Israel, you know there was a Christ. There was one who walked on this earth. When you and I take a volume that speaks of Christ, a book that speaks of Jesus Christ and gives predictions about his birth, about his life, about his death, and that same book brings forth the predictions are true and historians support it. I believe God exists because of the Christ of whom history tells me. Oh, by the way, that book that I mentioned that gives predictions that come true, their prophecies of old fulfilled in the new and it's called the Holy Bible. And when Jesus walked on this earth, John reported many other signs. Is that not what Josephus said? A man, if you can call him a man, he wasn't insulting Christ. He was talking about the wonderful works he did that the common man could not do. When Jesus performed a miracle, it was affirmed it was clean cut and immediate. Many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written. That you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and that believing you might have life through his name. History concludes there was a Christ, and it is something when I can step to this very book and find that even affirmed and much more with it. Here's a point. I know God exists not only because of the creation around me, not only of the common sense within me and the Christ of whom history tells me, but dear friends, of the conclusion without him. Sometimes you learn your best lessons in life when you learn what not to do rather than what you should do. For example, 
History records Thomas Paine, the leading atheistic writer, an American colonist, who made this plea near death. Stay with me for God's sake. I cannot bear to be left alone. Oh Lord, help me. Oh God, what have I done to suffer so much? What will become of me hereafter? I would give worlds if I had them that the age of reason had never been published. Oh Lord, help me. Christ, help me. No, no, don't leave. Stay with me. Send even a child to stay with me. For I am on the edge of hell here alone. If ever the devil had an agent. I had been that one. What about Sir Thomas Scott, the Chancellor of England, who said, until this moment I thought there was neither a God nor a hell. Now I know and feel that there are both, and I am doomed to perdition by the just judgment of the Almighty. May I turn to the words of Voltaire, a famous anti-Christian atheist stood firm against Christianity, looked at his doctor and said, I am abandoned by God and man. I will give you half of what I am worth if you will give me six months life. And Dr. Foshin looked at him and said, it could not be done. And Voltaire's conclusion was that I shall die and go to hell. But his nurse said this, for all the money in Europe, I would want to see another unbeliever die. All night long, he cried for forgiveness. Dear friends, the conclusion without him. If at the end of my life that I enter death and I take my last breath, and when I take my last breath, and within a matter of seconds, leaving this earth, and I see there is no God, and there is nothing, friends, I've lost nothing. But if I fail to believe in God, or fail to obey His blessed commands to obey the gospel, if I fail to do that, and I take my last breath and seconds into eternity, there is a God. I've lost everything. That's why, friends, when somebody says, now you talked about you know God exists, but you keep going back to the Bible. Well, dear friends, I can affirm we go back to the Bible because we can affirm there what we were able to affirm in the creation around us, the common sense within us. But Christ, who was a historical figure, and even here now, the conclusion without him. So my statement to you would be this. Do you believe that God exists? Will you allow that faith to change you? Because we understand without faith it is impossible to please him. He that comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Hebrews 11, 6. Jesus said, except you believe that I am, he, you shall die in your sins, that he is God in the flesh, through whom God sent into this world. John 3, verse 16. Believe that he is, John 8, 24. And for us to simply look and to make the plea unto him, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. A confession that while my heart believes unto righteousness, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Romans 10, verses 9 and 10. And then, yes, friends, to be baptized into Jesus Christ. Because he commanded it based upon faith. Mark 16, verse 16. And when we are baptized into Christ, we put on Christ, Galatians 3, 27. I can't put him on through faith. I can't put him on through repentance. I can't put him on through confession. But I can't put him on through baptism because that's what the Bible teaches. And I respond to his word. And I will walk by faith and not by sight. Romans chapter 8. For faith comes by hearing and hearing by 
the word of God. Romans 10, verse 17. How do I know God exists, friends? He is the creator through whom I embrace and enjoy his creation, the world and its beauty. He is the creator through whom we were created. He is the creator through whom his plan for man brought forth not only the divine life of Christ, that through him is salvation, Acts 4 and verse 12, and he is the creator with whom others concluded, too late for them, but not too late for you and I. He is the creator through whom will save us if we are obedient to his will. You see, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. Let me add this. When I was given this assignment, again, the way that I look upon it, is someone might say, well, I don't believe in God. And I've had people tell me, you know, why would you go to the Bible if I don't believe in God? What do I do? And that happened many years ago. So I began to answer. How do we know this? How do we know that? To where a person realizes that what they lack in believing is not really a belief at all. But when we're able to take this divine word from the end of the Genesis to the amen of the Revelation that is inspired of God, when we read in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, that all scripture is given by inspiration of God, is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Dear friends, when we look at the Word of God, this is the book that is sufficient. This is the book of which we will follow. And when we pose tonight the question, if you could ask God one question, what would it be? Dear friends, the only way we have authority to give a fair answer is to open up the Word of God. To open up God's Word and to seek His answers for our lives. This is the first question tonight we consider. Now I'm going to ask for Stan Stevenson, for the Black Kings, for the New Lord to come up and join me to my left. And as you are tuned in with us, on the radio here on WYTM on 105.5 WYTM Country. If you're listening to us on the radio on your dial from left to right, I'll be standing moderating this session and then joining me will be these good men that will take seats over to my left to the right on the dial. That's Brother Hugh Fulver, Brother Mike Hickson, and Brother Stan Stevenson. To let you know a little bit about these men, Brother Hugh Fulford, longtime gospel preacher, excellent writer for the spiritual storm. Please feel free to send him an email at Huford at Comcast.net. Did I get that correct, Brother Hugh? Huford, H U F O R D, Huford at Comcast.net, and he will add you to his weekly mailing, Hughes. Views and views. It's an outstanding article each week. He does a wonderful job. Lives in the Gallatin, Gallatin, Tennessee area. Brother Fulmer, delightful to have you with us here. And well, it's good to have you. Mike Hickson. Those of you on WYTM hear Mike every Sunday morning at 9 30. He brings forth the lesson Anchor for the Soul. Those of you viewing us from Facebook Live, YouTube, and eventually GBN, Bites No Stranger, does a great job with B.J. Clark on the program Counterpoint that has brought many individuals to Jesus Christ. Stan Stevenson is with us. Stan is an old principal boy just down the road. Stan preaches for the Adams Avenue Congregation in Lebanon, Tennessee. We appreciate Stan being here, so for the Hugh, for the Mike, for the Stan, good to have you. They'll be sharing a microphone among them tonight as we entertain some further questions that we wish to think about this evening, dear friends. Questions that you submit. A little bit of background, the question came once again. If you could ask God one question, what would it be? And as we would ask God that one question, there were questions submitted to us 
and one I just dealt with. We may come back to that as time permits, but our next question, we'll begin with Mike Nixon. Mike, the question we received, why are we here? Now, of course, the person writing that would be, what would be our purpose? Why are we, you know why we're here tonight, why are we here? Jeff, I think that's a great question. There are a lot of folks in the world today, quite frankly, that are wandering aimlessly through life, and they're looking for substance, meaning, and purpose to life. You know, I think about Jesus in John chapter 10. The Lord said, I have come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. To me, the beauty of the Christian life is that it is an abundant life. We enjoy blessings, spiritually speaking, yes. There are also a lot of other blessings that we enjoy in Christ. And so it's a very rich life, one that I think that many people that have tasted the benefits and the blessings of Christianity would affirm. So the psalmist said many years ago, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. But as we answer this question, I would encourage you to look at the book of Ecclesiastes. Solomon, of course, is the writer there. Solomon is entering into a laboratory, so to speak. And he is on a quest. His goal is to find the purpose or meaning of life. And I don't have to tell you what a great man Solomon was. Matter of fact, he alludes to a number of the blessings that he enjoyed as the king of Israel. He was a man of immense power. He was over the United Kingdom, succeeded his father David at the throne. And then a man of great popularity. He was a household name. I remember. Jesus said the Queen of the South came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And she said the half hasn't been told. So Solomon is quite a man. And then you can look in chapter 2. He talks about all the great possessions. His wealth. He was a man of immense wealth. Matter of fact, he would say that whatever his eyes desired, whatever he saw, he got it. And then the pleasures of life. He immersed himself in all the great pleasures that life has to bring. I think that there are a lot of people in the world today, if we were to tell them you could have power, you could be a household name, popular, you could have anything you wanted by way of material possessions, and you could immerse your life in great pleasures. If we said, would that make you happy? Would that give meaning to your life? The answer would be yes. You know, in chapter 2, verse 17, here's what Solomon said in light of all those things. Therefore, I hated life. So the conclusion is that there was a void, a vacuum in his life. And there are a lot of people in the world today, they think that the things of life are going to make them happy. There are a lot of folks in the world today, they have everything, but in some respects, they have nothing. So again, the words of Jesus, I come that you might have life have it more abundantly. So we turn over to the book of Ecclesiastes in chapter 12. And you remember the book begins in chapter 12, verse 1, by Solomon encouraging people to remember their creator in the days of their youth. And the reason is because when you're young, you're more pliable. As we get older in life, it's more difficult for us to make changes, changes that are necessary. In a very poetic way, Solomon talks about the demise of the human body. The fact of the matter is, this life as we know it, the human body is wearing out, running down. So then in verse 7, Solomon would tell us that at death, the body returns to the dust, but the spirit returns to God who gave it. So then it says if he's sitting in his laboratory, he's drawing his conclusions. So then in verse 13, here's what Solomon said. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. So what do you think, Solomon? Solomon is saying, in my quest to ascertain what life's all about, here it is. Fear God. Keep his commandments. One translation says, for this is man's all. The idea is the summation of life is to fear God. Keep his commandments. Why? Because that's what gives purpose and meaning to life. Paul said in 1 Timothy chapter 6, many, many years ago, godliness with contentment is great gain. There are people tonight that will go to, they will go to bed in a drunken stupor. They're miserable with their life. They're dealing with guilt and sorrow and any number of hardships in this life. 
And behind all of that, they're looking for purpose or meaning to life. Sadly, the, the devil has deceived them. Genuine peace and happiness are in one place. It's in Christ. You know, I think about the Christian life. We have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul would tell us in the book of Ephesians that if we're in Christ, we are rich, rich indeed. And then, as his people, we are royal. You think about it, to wear the name of Christ, to be one of his people, and then to think that we have a reward that awaits us, that reservation that Peter talks about in heaven. So what's life all about? It's about hearing God keeping his commandments. An excellent conclusion and thought from Ecclesiastes 12. Uh, one who was a wisdom through inspiration. Thank you, Mike. But do you wish to add anything? Well, keying off of what Mike has so eloquently <coughs> stated, I often talk about Solomon and all of the things that he tried in his search for the meaning of life. And I come up with five W's on that. He tried wisdom, and he had a lot of it. He tried wealth. He had a lot of that. He tried women. He had a lot of those. 300 wives and 700 concubines. I was once teaching a Bible class, and I asked the rhetorical question, how many wives too many did Solomon have? And the man sitting a few rows back and his wife sitting next to him spoke up and said, 300. She gave him a poke in the ribs. But he tried wisdom, he tried wealth, he tried women. And Solomon experienced, as a result of those things, many woes. But he finally came to his waking up and the realization that is Mike quoted from Ecclesiastes 12, 13. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God. Respect God and keep his commandments. Jesus said that the greatest commandment was to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, and with all of your strength. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like to it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus also said, Do not be afraid of those who kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him, respect him, who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Why are we here? Life in this world is training ground for eternity. Our life here in this world is to be preparatory for eternal life with God in heaven. It is the training ground for the soul. And the sooner we wake up and realize that, the better off we will be. Paul said, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. We are here to honor our Creator. God made us in His own image, and He breathed into our nostrils the breath of life. And we became living souls. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7. Stand a couple of moments of a concluding thought on this question, and then we'll come to you with another question. What I would suggest ties in with, of course, what Mike and Brother you both have said. Man is made up of a body and of a soul. And when Jesus was tempted to turn stones into bread after fasting 40 days and nights. Mark, uh, Matthew 4, 4 and Luke 4, 4, he responded by saying, Man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And you can have a biological existence by bread alone. You can satisfy the needs of the body, but you cannot satisfy the needs of the soul. And the challenge that we have is living in this material world with material needs, physical needs, and not allowing those physical needs to take priority 
over the spiritual. In Luke 12, Jesus was confronted by a man who wanted Jesus to make his brother divide his inheritance with him. And Jesus, first of all, said, I'm, I'm not getting involved in that kind of an affair. But then he told a parable of a rich farmer. The ground brought forth plentifully. And he, and he wanted us to know that a man's life does not consist in the abundance of the things that he possesses. Life is more than material things. So many people get lost in the weeds, as it were, living just for this world and not for eternity. And that's what we've got to keep in mind. I just wanted to mention one other thing. But as, as one of you was talking a moment ago, I couldn't help but think about how in many ways the devil has sown a lot of bad seed in this country. And that there was a day and time in America when many people believed in the God of heaven. And they believed in the ideals of scripture. And you talked just a minute ago about scripture, how all scripture is given by inspiration of God. I think that the devil in many ways has robbed America, the American people, of genuine satisfaction and contentment. And at one time in this country, we were people that deeply believed in God. That may be the case that many people don't believe or didn't believe in the New Testament, in New Testament Christianity as we do. But nonetheless, they believed in Scripture. They believed in the God of the Bible. And I think what the devil has done is sown seed in the hearts and lives of people in this country that says, you know what, you really don't need God. And you really don't need God's Word in your life. And as a result of that, there is this void. And people are searching. They're on this quest and they're looking to fill that void. You know, Jesus said many years ago, what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? What shall a man give in exchange for his soul? So the idea is, according to Jesus, if you put everything in the world, if you move your way into the world, when it's all said and done, you're the real loser. And I think that there are a lot of folks in our world today, they've lost out on the meaning of life, and that is because the devil has sown the seed that says, you know what, we really don't need God, we really don't need his word. And we might ask this question, how's that working out? Excellent point, Mike. And this is such an important question. And once again, for our uh, listening audience and for those who are viewing with us, this is Revival in America, the Q&A community gathering from Fayetteville, Tennessee. And we are addressing questions and building upon the statement or the question. If you could ask God one question, what would it be? And we've spent the last few moments talking about our purpose and why we are here. And brethren, I know there are individuals listening that are seeking, I have found this uh, through our work at International Gospel Hour and your work, my counterpoint, and, and the work that we do, people are seeking and they're looking, they're hungry, so there are those looking, and I'm thankful that we could give that answer. Pass the microphone, if you will, to stand for our next question, because as Mike said, the devil has really done a number on this world. Well, the devil has a way of impacting some of the best in history. Here is a question submitted. We'll begin with Stan. Why did God allow King David to take Uriah's wife, Bathsheba, as his wife, having committed so great a sin of adultery through vicious lust and premeditated murder? Stan? Thank you for the question. You are more than welcome. <laughs> People of moral character read what David did in 2 Samuel 11 in regard to Bathsheba and Uriah and find it detestable. Just no way to justify it in our minds. We know that. But as to why God will allow it, uh, well, Hughes already mentioned Genesis 2 and Genesis 1. 26, God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And verse 27 says, so God made man in his image and after his likeness. One of the aspects of being made in the image of God is God has a will. And God created man with a will. And God has given us the freedom to exercise that will. Adam and Eve exercised their will in violating God's prohibition of the even forbidden fruit. When God created them, He created them with that ability to make that choice. 
And so God gave David that choice. God made David made the wrong choice, obviously. But at the same time, so do we. We may not make the same sinful choice David did, but God allows us to make our choices. And our choices are not always what pleases God. Jesus said in John 6, 38, I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, the will of the Father that sent me. God had a will for Jesus. And the difference in us and Jesus, he kept it perfect. He did God's will. So God allowed David to make that choice. But if you read the rest of the story, you read that David suffered the consequences of that. God never approved of what David did. And so when God sent Nathan the prophet to rebuke David, he told him, first of all, the child that he'd been conceived would die. And then secondly, he said, the sword will never depart from your house. And the rest of the history of David finds that being fulfilled as the trouble that he had in his own house. God allowed David to exercise his will, even though the exercise of David's will was contrary to God's will. God didn't approve of that, but he allowed it. And another thing to think about, remember that throughout the Old Testament, God is going from, from the Garden of Eden to Calvary. He's moving in that direction to bring about salvation for mankind. And every person that God used to bring that about was fallible. There's only ever been one perfect man, that's Jesus. Even now, in the preaching of the gospel, the four of us on this podium, we make mistakes. We're fallible. There aren't any other kind of people for God to use. That's right. And thus, he used David. And while we find what David did to be so detestable because of his failure, at the same time, my failures in the eyes of God are not any greater or lesser than David's. I see. God's using us to preach the gospel, to live in a way to glorify Him, which goes back to our purpose. We talked about a moment ago. And you know, in the question submitted, why did God allow King David? And sometimes we look upon that allow to where, once again, we are created in God's image. We have a will, a choice. I think of uh, going back. To Joshua 24 and verse 15, when Joshua said, If it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That was their choice. And the choice that they made, and, what, and the choice that they were to make as well. And also keep in mind the end of 2 Samuel 11. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. Why well, they displeased him. Uh, still, David had a choice. A very wrong choice, based upon what was before him. Brother Mike and Brother Hugh, if you want to elaborate, if not, we'll press on. Well, I guess I'll jump in. A couple of books come to mind. Number one, there were things that God allowed, permitted, overlooked, if you please. Uh, for example, you remember in Matthew chapter 19 when Jesus was asked by the religious leaders of his day, is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? And the Lord answered that question with a question. And so he asked, have you not read? He that made them at the beginning made them male and female. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, cleave unto his wife, they too shall become one flesh. Wherefore there are no more two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man put asunder. Then they asked, why then did Moses command to give a right of divorcement? Jesus answered that by saying, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, permitted or suffered you to put away your mates. Now God's original intent was one man, one woman for life. That's evident based upon what the Lord said. But nonetheless, under the Mosaic dispensation, God allowed or tolerated that. And then I think about it in Acts chapter 17 when the Apostle Paul was in Athens. And you remember when he talked about the one true living God. Down in verse 7, rather, down in verse 30, 
He said, the times of ignorance God winked at, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. There are a couple of thoughts about David that come to mind. Number one, David was a man after God's own heart. Number two, God knew that David was a man that would accomplish his will. And David had a very illustrious history in the nation of Israel. Matter of fact, I would say that he was probably the greatest king in the history of Israel. But a third thing that stands out is penitent heart. You mentioned the fact just a moment ago with Sam that he was a powerful human being, as we all are. But you remember in Psalm 51, after Nathan had confronted him about his sin, David said before Almighty God, against you and you only have I sinned and done this great wickedness in your sight. Had he sinned against Bathsheba? Yes. Had he sinned against Uriah the Hittite? Well, again, the answer is yes. But nonetheless, ultimately, his sin was against Almighty God. So David had a very penitent heart, and God, God used him in a mighty way. Just as Brother Stan said a minute ago, he uses us to accomplish his will today. He uses fallible men to accomplish that will. And so uh, in the life of David, he made mistakes, yes. But overall, a good man, a great man, and a godly man. What Mike has just said leads me to the comment that I would make on this. There's another side to this story of David and Bathsheba. David was confronted with his sin, and he repented it of it. And when we come to the opening chapter of the New Testament, Matthew chapter 1, we see that David was in the fleshly lineage of Jesus Christ. God used David. Stan mentioned that from the Garden of Eden to the cross, God was working. God was gradually unfolding his plan. And even in the unfolding of that plan, there was a place for a man like David who committed this horrible sin uh, against God, against himself, against Bathsheba, and against her husband, Uriah. But God was able to use David because he was a man after God's own heart. And Solomon, the son that was born later, not the child that was born out of Solomon and Uriah's adulterous relationship, but the son that was born later to them, stood in the fleshly lineage of Jesus Christ. And so I think the overall lesson, the overriding lesson that we ought to take away from the David and Bathsheba incident is that God is able to bring good out of evil. I think of Saul of Tarsus in the New Testament. Think what kind of man he had been. He himself referred to himself as the chief of sinners. 1 Timothy 1.15 and yet he was converted. He became the great apostle Paul. He wrote at least 13 of the 27 books of the New Testament. So God is able to take man's bad choices and work them together for the accomplishment of his will. So we need to see the other side of David and David's life. Yes, he committed a terrible sin. But when confronted with it, he repented, and as we said, he straightened up, and he tried to serve God as faithfully as he could. And how good that God can bring forth the purpose in our lives. Uh, all things work together for good. Didn't say everything with you. All things work together for good to them that love God, who are the call according to his purpose, Romans 8, 28. You tie in the purpose there we have in life and how God can take good from something bad and make it better. Uh, that stands out so true in how these are blending in so well together. We're going to come with the next place with Brother Hugh in just a moment. But first of all, uh, again, this is Revival in America, the Q&A community gathering here from the Lincoln Academy Auditorium in Fayetteville, Tennessee. We're coming up on the 8 o'clock hour. We will continue until about 8.30 p.m. 
and then we will conclude the work for that day. So continue, those of you that have joined us on YouTube through the West Fayetteville page, uh, grateful you're with us live, and we're going to continue here on WYTN 105.5 Country, or shall I say 105.5 WYTN Country, let me get it right. It's in my contract, if you will. Brother Hugh, we'll come to you. Let's discuss. Here is a question that a lot of people will look and say, I am confused. Why are there so many churches? Why are there so many churches, Brother Hugh? And what could we answer? That is a question that puzzled me. Well, <clears throat> we are aware that it is a puzzling question that's confusing to honest, sincere souls as to why are there so many churches? If we could move back in history 2,000 years to the first century, how many different kinds of churches would we find then? We would not find any different kinds of churches. We would not find any of the denominations that are on the face of the earth today. Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, after Simon Peter had confessed that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of God, Jesus said, upon this rock, this truth that Peter had confessed, that Christ was the Son of God, upon this rock, Jesus said, I will build my church, singular, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Jesus promised to build one church. The Apostle Paul said in Acts chapter 20 and verse 28 that the church was purchased with the blood of Christ. Christ purchased only one church. Paul wrote in the great book of Ephesians, chapter 1, verses 22 and 23, it said that God had put all things under Christ's feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. And then three chapters later in chapter 4, he says there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling. So Christ promised to build one church. He purchased one church. He is, he is the head of of the church, which is his body, and there is but one body. Before Christ went to the cross, he prayed for the unity of all who would believe in him. John chapter 17, verses 20 and 21. Neither for these only, the apostles, do I pray, but for those also who shall believe on me through their word through the preaching of the apostles, that they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that the world may believe that you have sent me. So first of all, we need to understand that though there are many churches in the world today, that's not the way it was in the beginning. Christ established one <coughs> church throughout the New Testament we read of only one church. Now we're not talking about just one local church, one local congregation. The gospel spread throughout uh, the world of that day. Wherever the gospel went, congregations were established. Local churches. These were churches of Christ. Romans 16, 16. Christ had established the church. He had purchased it. He was the head of it. And so these churches were rightfully called, not exclusively, but they were rightfully called 
churches of Christ. So what happened? Why do we now have so many different kinds of churches? Well, various doctrines and practices have been invented and devised by human beings since the close of the New Testament. And as a result of these different doctrines and practices that conflict with New Testament teaching, we have all of the different kinds of churches that we have on earth tonight. Paul warned the elders of the church at Ephesus in Acts chapter 20 that a great falling away would take place. He said, I know that after my departure, grievous or savage wolves will enter in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves, men will speak perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. He wrote to Timothy and said that the Spirit expressly says in latter times, later times, some shall depart from the faith. And he warned in 2 Timothy chapter 4 that the time would come when they would not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own lust, having itching ears, they would heap up to themselves teachers after their own lust, teachers who would satisfy their itching ears. John warned, 1 John chapter 4 verse 1, do not believe every spirit, but try the spirit because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Now anyone can take a church history book and learn the origin of the various churches. We can learn how the Catholic Church gradually developed, how it evolved from the original church that we read of in the New Testament, how that over a period of time the hierarchy developed, how that in time one man came to be regarded as the head of the church, and he was referred to, and still is referred to, as the Pope. And we can read about how the Catholic Church held sway over uh, the so-called Christian world for many hundreds of years. And then we can read about a reformation that took place. Men began to realize that they had gotten away from the New Testament pattern and the New Testament teaching. And so there, there was an effort to reform the church. And so various denominations began coming into existence. The Lutheran Church, for example, was the first Protestant denomination established in 1521. Now stop and think about it for a few minutes. That's the first Protestant denomination. And it's only been here 500 years. So we have the Lord's Church going all the way back to New Testament times. It, is, it started on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. So here is the key to why we have all of these different churches. And you can come on down the stream of time, learn when the Church of England slash the Episcopal Church started, 1534, how it started when the King of England decided that he no longer wanted the church, the Catholic Church in England, to be under the control of the Pope. So he just pulled the Catholic Church in England out from under the control of the Pope, set himself up as the head of the Church of England in this country known as the Episcopal Church. You can study the origin of the Presbyterians, the Baptists, the Methodists, the Nazarenes, all of the different denominations. Now let me hasten to say that I'm not mentioning these names tonight of these various denominations in a derogatory sense. Not at all. But the question is, why are there so many different churches? And we're explaining why there are the different churches, the different denominations have arisen out of the movements of men, 
not out of the plan of God, the work of Christ, or what we find in the New Testament. God wants us to be united, and we can never unite in a particular denomination. We can never unite around a denominational creed. The only basis of unity is what the Word of God teaches. And if we will return to the Scriptures, if we'll go back to the Bible, that's what the churches of Christ are pleading for, not a reformation of anything, but a restoration of original New Testament undenominational Christianity. <coughs> Let's speak as the oracles of God. Let's speak where the Bible speaks and remain silent where the Bible is silent. Let's be in 2023 what people were in AD 33 and for the next many decades after the beginning of the church. There in Acts chapter 2 as we read in our Bible. Thank you very much, Brother Hugh. We'll pass any comments with Mike or Stan. I wish to add a little bit more. Stan, if you would, please. Why are there so many churches? Well, the Wolford's description was quite thorough. Stan, let's add some more to that. Well, the passage that always comes to my mind is what Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy 2 2. The things that thou hast heard of me or learned of me among many witnesses, the same. Commit thou to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. And the key phrase, well, there are a lot of key phrases, obviously, but the same. Paul taught Timothy. He wanted Timothy to take the same things that Timothy had learned of Paul, which Paul learned them through the Holy Spirit by inspiration, and pass those on to faithful men who would teach those same things to others. And as Brother Hugh mentioned, through the stream of time, somewhere along the way, the same has been changed. Now, who changed it? And by what right, by what authority did they have to change it? Uh, he mentioned 2 Timothy 4. That men would have itching ears and keep themselves <laughs> teachers after their own lust. So people wanted preaching and teaching that would accommodate their lifestyle and their desires. So the same has changed. Whether it's what it takes to become a Christian, what it takes to worship as a Christian, to live as a Christian, changes have been made. And as I've said repeatedly, different places, the problem is man sometimes thinks he's smarter than God. And therefore we can change him. And another verse that comes to mind, in Matthew 21, when Jesus, the last week of his life, was teaching in the temple, and they came to him and asked him by what authority he did that teaching and who gave him that authority. Well, he turned that and said, I'll ask you a question. You answer mine, I'll answer yours. And then he asked this question, the baptism of John. Which was it from heaven or from men? That question can be applied to any doctrine that's taught today. Is it from heaven? If it is, I don't have the right to change anything about it. My obligation is to accept it and to the best of my ability try to obey it and live by it. If it's from men, it's not worth the paper it's written on. And it certainly can and will be changed. And it won't matter except to God. So true. And so it's like if, as we build it from the premise, if you could ask God one question, and someone would say, why are there so many churches? Brother Hugh, I think you eloquently explained it, Stan, you enhanced it a little bit more as well, that God's answer would be, that was not my plan. And so if we go back to God's plan, then we know that's right. When we go back to the church, we read of the New Testament, we know that church is right. It's the only church we as preachers have the authority to proclaim to the union. It's so true. Let's mention very quickly, we know some of you are listening to us on 
105.5 WYTM Country joining us on YouTube. And you might think, well, I have a question. If I could ask God one question, here's what I would ask. Well, what you do, please go to westfayetteville.net. Find and scroll down a little where it says Revival America. Click on it, scroll down, and you'll be able to find where you can submit your question. And Lord willing, we'll do our best to address the question either Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday night as we'll be back here at 7 o'clock Central Time tomorrow evening. We're coming up in about the last 15 minutes or so, so I want to in turn, yes, Mike? I don't mind. Well, I do mind, but go ahead. No, I don't mind. These two brethren said some things that I'd like to just maybe piggyback off of for just a moment. And that is... You know, in John chapter 17, the passage that Brother Hugh alluded to a minute ago, I don't think it ought to be lost on us that in the shadow of the cross, Jesus prayed for unity among all that would believe on him through their word. And I think it's key to point out that the means by which unity can be achieved is through the apostles' doctrine. The reason why we have all these different churches wearing different names, practicing different doctrines, is because we've gotten away from the divine standard, the pattern. And anytime you get away from the standard, then problems are going to occur. It was said in the early church that they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. You remember one of the problems that existed in the church at Corinth was division. They were dividing up and uh, among party names. And Paul said that there was to be no division among them, but he said the answer to their division was that you all speak the same thing. <clears throat> We're clearly not all speaking the, the same thing in the religious world today. The only way that we can get back to what the Lord wants is to accept this book as divine truth. As the Apostle Peter said, if any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. You know, in Matthew chapter 5, you remember Jesus said on numerous occasions, you've heard it's been said by them of old time. But then he inserted divine authority and said, but I say to you, well, the Lord has all authority, Matthew 28, 18. God the Father said that you're to hear him. Matthew chapter 17, verse 5. So whatever, whatever the Lord says, we ought to be attentive to so when it comes to matters of religion, think about when it comes to the church. Brother Hugh gave really a historical overview of the various denominations that have made their way into the world. Well, we ought to go back and say, what does the Bible say? And you know, the Bereans, they were commended because they had an open heart and an open Bible. The text says in Acts chapter 17, verse 11, they searched the scriptures daily to see whether those things were so. Paul was an inspired apostle. Yet they checked him out. And in the religious world today, there are a lot of folks that will tell you, well, one church is good as another. It doesn't matter whether or not you're affiliated with the church. Well, the question is, what does the Bible say? And there are a lot of things that are being passed off as doctrine when, in fact, after further investigation, don't meet the litmus test of divine truth. So I think we need to just call people back to the Bible. If you please. May I add one more thing? A couple of more things. Jesus said, Jesus taught in parables. One of, one of the great parables of Jesus is called the parable of the soul. The sower went forth to sow. Well, that sower represented preachers. And the seed that they were to sow was the gospel. And in the first century, the seed, which is the word of God, produced undenominational Christians. As I was driving to Fayetteville this afternoon from my home in Gallatin, I passed through some pretty farm country and I saw a lot of cornfields. And I knew that somebody had planted cotton seed and had gotten corn. Anybody taking me seriously? Why did I see cornfields? Because corn seed had been planted.
seed reproduce after their kind. That's a law that God set in motion at the very beginning. The seed would re reproduce after their kind. That's true in the physical realm. It's true in the spiritual realm. If we will plant only the Word of God in the hearts of people today, and if they will believe only the Word of God, they will be only what people were religiously in the first century. Christians and Christians only. And that's what we are pleading for people to be. There was a great gospel preacher many years ago by the name of E.W. Stovall. Brother Stovall was a particularly effective preacher on the radio. And everywhere he lived, he conducted a radio program. And he had a wide listening audience. And Brother Stovall would contrast the denominational doctrines with the teaching of God's Word. And there was an older couple in one of the towns where Brother Stovall was conducting his radio program, and they listened to Brother Stovall every day when he came on the radio. And after several weeks of listening, one day when the program was over, the man in the family turned to his wife, it was just this older couple, and he said to his wife, Mama, We've been wrong. They were members of a prominent denomination. And they listened to Brother Stovall preach. And they became convinced of what the Bible teaches. So he turned to his wife and he said, Mama, we've been wrong. And we've got to get right. And that's what they did. They obeyed the gospel. They were baptized into Christ for the remission of their sins. And the Lord added them to that same church that he added people to in New Testament times. We can be one in Christ. We can be one on the basis of God's Word. Excellent comments, brethren. So as we are about to conclude tonight, why are we here? God gives us purpose. God has a purpose for us. And while there are things that happen in our lives and we make bad choices, God can take those and make good choices, like he did with David, with Saul, and others. And how is he able to do that? Through Christ. And the church we read of in the scripture when we just keep going back uh, to the word of God. Good discussion tonight. We have about eight minutes left. So what we're going to do is we're going to wrap up tonight by how we began. And our question earlier, how do I know God exists? We're now entering to what we would call a two minute warning. So my three fellow panelists will have about a couple of minutes each to elaborate on someone asking you, how do you know God exists? Do you vote or how do you know God exists? Well, again, as you said in your presentation, <coughs> excuse me, as you said in your presentation, I do not hesitate to go to the Bible and there is an illuminating verse in the book of Hebrews, chapter 3, verse 4. For every house is built by someone or some man, but he who built all things is God. We are in a large, magnificent structure. This building we're in, this house that we're in. How did it get here? One day there was a big explosion and it all just fell into place. And everything as you see it just suddenly appeared. None of us believe that. Well go beyond just this one house and look at this universe this world. How did it get here? Every house is built by some man. Somebody built every house that's on the face of this earth. They didn't just 
come into existence through spontaneous combustion. Somebody built them. He who built all things is God. Take something as simple and as uncomplex as a bird's nest. How did it get here? Did it just evolve and then it created a bird to nest in? Or was the bird here first? Mind, intelligence, first in connection and relationship to the nest. Did the bird make the nest or did the nest make itself and then bring the bird into existence? We need to think about those kinds of questions before we're too quick to question the existence of God. Mike, how do I know God exists? How do you know God exists? Two minutes. Well, I know that you appeal to creation, but you appeal to creation, and I think that's a tremendous argument. <coughs> David says, the heavens declare the glory of God, the firmament shows his handiwork. It doesn't take an Einstein to realize somebody created the world we live in. It doesn't take an Einstein to realize somebody created the human body. No wonder David said that we've been fearfully and wonderfully made. But I want to appeal to something else. You talked about the Bible. We can know that there is a God on the basis of creation. But I can't know the mind of God separate and apart from revelation. Let me ask you this question. How in the world did a book like this, written over a period of 1,500 years, by 40 different writers, how in the world did this book come into being? By chance? Absolutely not. But rather, holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And you remember David said many years ago, the Spirit of the Lord was on my tongue. <coughs> well, David wrote by inspiration, as did, as did the other writers. But here's the point. When I look at the scriptures, you have one united theme. The Old Testament is pointing to the coming of the Christ. The New Testament is an affirmation that the Christ has come. And so you remember in Ephesians chapter 3, Paul said he received revelation from God. And he said he took that revelation, wrote it down in a few words. He said, whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Well, that mystery that had been concealed but later revealed had to do with the Gentiles becoming a part of the body of Christ. Isaiah, who wrote some seven centuries before the coming of the Christ into the world, talked about the church as an exalted mountain into which all nations would flow. Well, the all nations there would represent both Jews and Gentiles. And so the point I think to really press is that the Old Testament is the New Testament conceived. The New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. And so when you pick up this book, is this the product of man? Well, the answer is absolutely not. How do I know that God exists? Well, I know that God exists on the basis of creation. But moreover, I also know that God exists because this book is divine testimony. This book is the product of Almighty God. No wonder Paul says all scripture, every scripture, is inspired of God and is profitable. So God's word can profit our lives. Stan, I'll hold you one tomorrow night, but our time has gotten away. We've done a great job tonight, and with our time drawing to a close, we thank you for being with us, whether on our YouTube viewing tonight or 105.5 WITM Country. Gentlemen, brethren, thank you for your time tonight. Brother you, Brother Mike, Brother Stan, how about if we do it tomorrow night? One more tonight. To our 105.5 WITM Country listeners, We'd like for you to stay tuned to an encore presentation of the International Gospel Hour with yours truly, Jeff Archie. It's been my pleasure to be with the panel tonight. We'd like to ask you to join us tomorrow night at 7 o'clock for Revival in America, the Q&A Community Gathering, or join us live at the Lincoln Academy Auditorium at 7 p.m. Again, we thank you for listening tonight. Please stay tuned to an encore presentation of the International Gospel If you have questions about your salvation, 
you like to desire prayer with a struggle or problem you are facing, as you exit the auditorium, you can go to your right, but brethren will be there to direct you to a room where you can visit with some good brothers that are there to visit and pray with you. Thank you for being with us tonight, for your interest in the things that be of God. Be sure to let us know how we can be of help to you. And with that said, we bid you a good night.